So I kind of describe my way of working as a stream of consciousness where one thing leads to another and leads to another. And before you know it, I'm in a place that I had no idea I would be when I started. And that's kind of what happened with this show. We can go to the first slide. Um, this is an installation of the show. Uh, these are uh, portraits. I'll get to them in a little bit. They're kind of the second half of the group. Okay, the next one. Trees and music have always been uh, important, iconic imagery in my work, and it felt like a good place to start. Okay, next. And next slide. I was cruising right along, and I ended up um, including a lot of music pieces. Next slide. These are installation shots. There'll be uh, individual shots as we finish this. Okay, one more. Okay, and that's the full circle of the gallery. Okay, so this is a good starting point. About uh, three years ago, I was laminating works on paper to panels and painting on them. And I did a series using a tree that was originally a, uh, a solar plate that was 10 by eight inches. And in this case, I blew it up to about 25 inches tall and made this piece and collaged it onto a panel. So it's kind of a starting point and that's where I took off from in developing works for the show. Next. This was a series that came from using the, the winged victory as an icon. And as I was working on a new series of trees, I developed this image of a tree down the street in the Rose Park where I walk our dog every day. I did a drawing, photographed it, made a plate, and I did a series and it's in a lot of the additional works. But I also did a large image of this by blowing up the image on, uh, on the computer and in Photoshop made a transparency that's 23 by 32 and made a series of which you'll see other pieces. But the transparency becomes a, uh, an art object in itself. And in this case, what I did was I put the transparency on top of the wooden panel that already had the print of the winged victory and the pillar on the left. And you can see the border of the paper within the image. I was gonna to point to it, but you can't see me doing that. Uh, you can see the border of the paper collaged onto the panel. And then the, the tree is collaged on top of that in a transparency. And I've been doing that a lot, a lot of layering, one thing on top of another. Um, okay, next slide. An older work that uh, a similar tree just got uh, added to. This is a 12 by 16 piece it's called New Space for, what is that? New Space for Small tr Small Tree. Yeah. And those birds, I have to grab some. A long time ago, a, a dear friend made a shirt for me and it had all these birds on it. And when I wore the shirt down and I can no longer wear it anymore, I started tearing it up and using it for collage. And then my friend David, David Hopman, who's important part of this show because he took a number of the photos that I worked from, he said, photograph everything, put it into a file and you'll eventually use it. And sure enough, I photographed the last remnant that I had of this and every time I need some collage elements of birds, I come to my printer and print it out. And that's where the birds come from in this image. Okay, next. This was done uh, on a trip to Cuba about a year and a half ago. It was a demo piece. On the left side is some information from a magazine. And there's that Rose Park tree and the birds. So it's kind of a quintessential piece of mine, breaking up the space like a diptych, even a triptych, and creating kind of a uh, stage for different elements. Pretty typical of my work. Next.
Next slide. And this one was finished on that Cuba trip. I had a background with a monotype on it. One of the nice things about working in photopolymer gravure is that you're making transparencies to be able to make plates. And when you have the transparencies, they become a resource to go from piece to piece and decide what would it look like if I dropped this image on top of this background? What would I look like if it went on top of this? So I had this background and I had the transparency and the plate of that tree. And at the moment, I just brought the two together and then a drawn line is the, is the dome shape. Okay, next. This was done this past year in Italy. Uh, we had a day where we were in, um, in a private studio. It was just a beautiful retreat. And it's an old piece that our son Ryan, who you'll meet later on in the work, he did this drawing one time years ago and it stood on top of my studio for years. He didn't wanna come down to the studio with me. He was about seven years old at the time. And uh, Adam, our other son, and my wife were out somewhere. It was a Saturday morning and he wanted to play basketball. And I said, Ryan, you'll have to wait, come down to the studio, I have a few things to do. I gave him this piece of paper and he started drawing mean old dad. And there are those images of dad in there. And when I learned how to use Photoshop and digital technology, I photographed the piece and made a plate from it. So that is on top of a drawing of our, or a painting of our grandson, Charlie, who you will meet as well. Next. Typical baby grand tree, uh, the shape of the baby grand piano. I don't know if you can see it, it's behind me right here. Part of my music sessions that we do on a weekly basis. In fact, I had my first music session. Uh, Chick, I know you're there. I saw you a little while ago. You'll love to hear this. Um, had a music session this past Wednesday and just four of us played outside on our patio. Social distancing, acoustic. And boy, it was great. So I'm back to playing music. We'll see when we can get back into the studio. But that's pretty typical music piece with the nature and the tree. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Next. That same tree from uh, the Rose Park worked into a photopolymer plate. There's two photopolymer plates here. One has the tree, the other has the keyboard and the, tr and the piano shape. And the rest is monotype. And it comes together in a series kind of. The next one will show you more about it. Okay, next. <clears throat> Same image, but in this one, remember earlier I told you I took a photopolymer image from a, a transparency and I collaged it onto the panel. Well, in this case, I have uh, transparencies with, I'm looking around, I wasn't prepared for that. I had some around, but transparencies that have pictures of palettes. And I'll take a transparency and put it on top of a piece in the end to see how it might work. And this one, indicated a blue-green kind of wave. And I thought that was a perfect title for what we got coming. Next. So then I was getting into these larger pieces. That's what that large photopolymer plate was made for. The tree is a full-size tree, but it was blocked out to accommodate the spacing for the lamp. Now, when we started social distance, and when we started sheltering, I went into our living room a lot and watched more TV than I probably should have. And this lamp is staring at me. And I've had this lamp in my consciousness for years and I decided it's time to do something with it. So it's a digital inkjet photograph of the lamp and then a photopolymer print of the, uh, the tree on top of it. But you'll notice that the tree is coming through the top of the, the, the lamp without printing on top of it. The area where the lampshade is, I put a stencil on when I printed the tree, so it didn't print across that. But having it totally blank was not as cool as having a really light impression. So after I ran it through the press one time, I pulled off the stencil 
and in essence printed the ghost of the tree on top of the lampshade. So it went through the press back and forth, really two times, but really it's one plate one time. But the first time through was fully printed with a stencil. And then when I returned it, I had removed the stencil to print what was left on the plate. So that's what gives that really eerie feeling of that tree coming through that, wind, that uh, lampshade. Okay, next. This was one of the last pieces I did um, preparing for the show until uh, a detour happened. And it's combining the lampshade with the tree, with the keyboard, and with a forest scene in the background. And to reduce the forest scene, I collaged a piece of, of uh, rice paper on top of it. So it reduced the background, and then I printed on top of that. So it's a lot of layers. And as I said, one thing leads to another, leads to another. And I was cruising right along. And at about this time, I'm talking about late March, and we're, we're now sequestered for a long period of time. And I decided to take a detour. Next slide. And I did a few portraits, little six by six portraits, drawings. Uh, derived from a photo of my mentors from college. This is Jack Wolski, my drawing teacher, and I have a little story to tell you later on when I show you the original work here um, about Jack and, and my involvement with him. So I did a, these three six by six drawings of Jack, and the next one is Mirko. You can go to that, Jessica. Mirko was my drawing and uh, design teacher. And he said, he was from Ukraine, and he said, you take printmaking, you must take printmaking with Robert Marx. And sure enough, next semester I did, and the next slide will show you Robert. This is uh, Robert Marx, I credit as being the most important person in my career as an artist. I walked into the printmaking studio and I immediately fell in love. I fell in love with the smells, I fell in love with the way the ink transfers to the plate, from the plate to the paper. I loved the reversal of it, everything about it, and I loved him. He was just such a perfect person for me at the time. And we're still in touch. In fact, I need to call him later today. I don't know if he's even checked into this. So um, I did these three portraits, really just six by six portraits, sent them off for a fundraiser. I had photographed them, but I recognized what an incredible experience I had while working on them, that I not only spent a lot of time with each individual, and I got the sense, a spiritual sense, of being in their presence. And this was really very uh, pronounced. And in the time when we're now being by ourselves, I found that to be a really good way to connect with those people I've been missing the most. So it led to the rest of the series. And also I thoroughly enjoyed the drawing process, which is something that I know I can do, but I hadn't really concentrated on specific drawing and the figure very much. So these last three, these three mentor images were all done by looking at a photograph and drawing. The next slide, will show you a, a little more intensity. This is David Hopman. He's my photographer friend. And right after finishing the, port, the mentor portraits, I said to David, hey, do you have any photos of, of you that are straight on? Because I had this idea simultaneously to missing all my friends and my family and, and having this sense of being isolated from all that. I also read a letter to the editor in our paper while one of our writers was uh, commending Santa fans by saying how great we were in wearing masks and, and really protecting everybody from virus and so on. She was lamenting the missing of the smiles behind the masks. So that really clicked with me. And I said, what if we could do masks that had people's faces on them? And when I started doing the drawings, it dawned on me I could make plates. And if I can make plates, I can print multiples of these drawings. If I could print multiples, multiples of the drawings, I could print on fabric. 
and this is what I did. So for every one of the next, uh, or the, all these portraits, I photographed the original portrait and I made a plate and the plate was then printed on a piece of paper with a tinted background. Then another impression was made on a piece of fabric. And these pieces of fabric, I'm just gonna grab one here. This is one of the pieces of fabric with, uh, with a portrait, part of a portrait on it. This gets cut out and made into a mask and then gets assembled onto the background, which is the entire portrait. This is Lou. He plays bass for our music group and is probably the, uh, my oldest friend here in Santa Fe. We were roommates when I moved to Santa Fe 42 years ago. Okay, next. Family. Adam is here with me now. He's my photographer to, uh, to shoot the remainder of this presentation. And he was the first family portrait I did. And I sat very tightly, I'll explain how all these portraits are done to get the likenesses and so on as soon as I'm finished with the slideshow. Okay, next. Adam's wife, Leah, our daughter-in-law. This one turned out great, and I, I think just the softness of the face works great for me. These are all 12 by 16, 16 by 12, 16 tall by 12 inches, and they're framed up in black frames in the show. Next. Our older, other son, Ryan, lives in Oakland, outside of Oakland, with his family, and um, Nikki is next. And there's a funny story with Nikki. I brought the, the remainder of these drawings with us when Marianne and I drove to Oakland uh, three weeks ago. It was the first time we had a chance to visit our, our new grandson. And we were there for two weeks. And I finished several of these drawings while I was there. Well, to do these drawings, I, I was putting them up on a window to get uh, transparency showing through so I could get the likeness of where the spots are. I'll show you this in a bit. Well, at one point I was doing Nikki and I had it up on the window, on the front window of their house. And it was up there for a couple of days because I took a few breaks working on it. And she went outside and she saw the, the original photo up there and she said, God, it looks like I'm a missing person. You got to take that down. So I quickly finished the drawing, moved on. Next. Next slide. Yes, and this is Charlie, our three-year-old grandson. His brother James is the one we went to visit for the first time. And this is the last image in the series. So what I wanna do um, is take a few minutes and I'm gonna go around the studio here and show you how all these portraits were done. So let's move to the studio.